what we wanted to do is to push on and get the supersonic. That was the big one. Um, you know, that's the big, big, that's the Mount Everest, if you like, of land speed record racing. Almost from the first day a jet engine was used in land speed racing, many had wondered if a car could ever break the sound barrier. Most people thought it was impossible. Almost everyone thought it was suicidal. But in August 1995, Richard Noble unveiled a new car. This is Thrust SSC, the supersonic car. Undertaking a project like this is just an enormous, enormous undertaking. I mean, for instance, with the Thrust 2 project, we involved 225 companies. With this one, it was 231. A huge industrial enterprise has got to be put together to, um, to actually support it. Managing such a complex project meant Noble had to vacate the hot seat of the car itself. That was a job that would demand the skills of a specialist. Andy Green is a Royal Air Force Tornado fighter pilot. Breaking the speed of sound is part of his daily routine. When Green was offered the chance to drive a car at over 750 miles per hour, he leaped at the opportunity. It's a chance to do something which every little kid uh, dreams about. Every little boy wants to be a, you know, a, a jet pilot and a space pilot and, uh, and a, uh, a land speed record driver. It is something intrinsically very, very exciting. Controlling a modern jet fighter demands concentration and discipline. Green's Air Force training made him ideally suited for the task ahead. As a fast jet pilot, you're part of a very large team. I fly with a navigator, so myself and a navigator, then the ground crew who service from the airplane. That also runs onto the mental side of not actually being frightened of driving the biggest car you've ever sat in, because it's the biggest ever. For me, to be not frightened of that was essential because I had to be comfortable in it, had to operate in it. Richard Noble knew that Green was the man for the job. We've got a thousand hours of flying fighters. He's used to controlling this sort of machinery. Mind you, in the air, of course, uh, you've got um, quite a bit more space to actually sort yourself out when things go wrong. You're not on the ground, you know, with your backside just a, a few inches off the deck. Traveling at the speed of sound generates an enormous shockwave. It was the effect this might have on Thrust SSC that was the team's greatest worry. OK, here we are, flying at about 300, 350 miles an hour, 250 feet above the sea, and we're going to accelerate to supersonic, faster than the speed of sound. That's about 750 miles an hour. The problem with that is, as you approach the speed of sound, at about 700 miles an hour, you get huge pressure waves starting to build up on the front of the aeroplane, which eventually causes the so-called sound barrier and makes a sonic boom created by all sonic vehicles. Now, on an aeroplane, this isn't really a problem because the pressure waves, the shock waves, actually spread out from the aircraft in all directions. Of course, with a car, that's very different because the shock waves underneath the car have nowhere to go. There's a huge pressure buildup under the car. That's the difficult bit about going supersonic on land. Any buildup of pressure between the supersonic car and the ground would be catastrophic. If you get it wrong, the car will take off and it will go straight up through the clouds. It won't just tumble like a little Formula One car or something. It will go up through the clouds. It will be a most awful spectacle. The decision to give Thrust SSC twin jet engines was not just to provide extra power. It was to ensure stability and keep it on the ground. With two massive engines, Thrust SSC weighed in at 10 tons, the heaviest and biggest land speed car ever built. Basically, uh, the heavy bit is the engine, so yeah, it's got to be up near the front wheels, so you get your 60% of the front wheels. If that's the case, where do you put the driver? 
Well, suppose we have two engines. That's good, so we get the weight in the right place. Then we put the driver in the valley between the two engines. That works well. And then we've got to have a nice pointed nose on it to minimize the size of the shock waves. And then before long, the car actually designs itself. By far, the most controversial aspect of the car's design was its steering. Normal front wheel steering was not an option. We could steer the front wheels, we put bulges on the side of the car, but if we did that, then that would be an increase in cross-sectional area and we'd never go supersonic. So this little team of three solemnly decided to build a rear wheel steer car. <laughs> I mean, to really sort of double the risk. <laughs> rear wheel steering is more normally found in forklift trucks rather than high performance cars. The first tests in 1996 were carried out in the Al Jaffer Desert in Jordan. But the rear wheel steering was almost impossible to control. We had a lot of problems with keeping the vehicle stable. Uh, we had created what we believed was the greatest vehicle ever created for the land speed record. It was going to do something no other vehicle had done but it was very, very hard to control. Now, my fear was letting the team down because my driving abilities weren't enough to control what was basically a directionally unstable car. You know, the definition of an undrivable vehicle is the driver is not good enough to control it. That was always my greatest fear. It had taken four years to get this far, but the fastest the car would go was only 340 miles per hour. As time dragged on, the team's morale and faith in the car reached rock bottom. The team uh, having built the car was so thrilled with it, they couldn't conceive a situation where anything would go wrong. From now on, you know, just get it out there and we just do it and come home after lunch, you know, that sort of thing. And of course it wasn't like that. And basically we were a disaster. We were a team who um, were talking about going supersonic, had somehow created this enormous car and had got 340 miles an hour. You know, we were bad news. By the time unseasonal rain drove them home, Noble's team was dejected and the project almost bankrupt. Ten months later, the Thrust SSC team traveled to Black Rock Desert, Nevada. The only thing that had kept them going after their disastrous trip to Jordan was grim determination. The steering and suspension had been completely modified and rebuilt. By the time it rolled out onto the desert on September 8, 1997, driver Andy Green's faith in the car had been totally restored. Rehearsals were over. For five weeks, FIA timing equipment would officially monitor Thrust SSC's attempt to break the sound barrier. We had built the ultimate research tool. It was 54 feet long, it had 100,000 horsepower, and would then produce from its 100 sensors everything that was happening to it. We were doing a safe approach, and we needed to test all the system and to test the airflow very gradually, gradually building the speed up so that every single time as we got to a speed, we analyzed all the data, we knew we were safe, we could safely add 10 miles an hour onto the speed uh, and still be perfectly comfortable and the airflow wouldn't do anything strange. The team's tactics paid off. Day by day, Green slowly edged thrust SSC ever closer to Mach 1, the speed of sound. Zero, zero, point, six, six, one. After three weeks, they captured the official unlimited world record with a two-way average of 714 miles per hour. But dust storms hampered their work, and the sound barrier was still proving elusive. Uh, Finally, with just days of the season left, conditions were perfect. At last, as Green tore through the measured mile, the desert echoed to the sound of a sonic boom. Thrust SSC had broken the sound barrier on the first leg of its run. But as Green released his main chute, all hell broke loose. Nothing on chute one, this is chute two. Two miles to go, 500 miles an hour. 
Just like it had to Craig Breedlove 33 years before, a faulty shoot failed to stop the car. Luckily for Green, Black Rock has more room than Bonneville, and there are no telephone poles to hit. But with the overrun of valuable 15 minutes of the allotted one-hour turnaround were wasted, towing the car back to the course. Green was up against the clock, but on the return run, the car was handling like a dream. As he shot through the measured mile with a speed of 760 miles per hour, a second boom confirmed they had another supersonic run. Their excitement was short-lived. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot do that. You missed it by about a minute. Just 49.6 seconds over the hour, FIA officials disallowed the record. But the run had not been a waste. An aerial photograph had captured this incredible sight. The supersonic shockwave spread out as a line from the nose of the car, highlighted by the sunlit dust. The following morning, spectators turned up in force in the hope that they could witness history being made. The question now was, could Thrust SSC do it all over again? The first run was flawless. Thrust SSC went as straight as an arrow, covering the measured mile in just five seconds. No instability, no shoot failure, and another sonic boom. Uh, station, the provisional Mac number is, say, 1.015. It's a supersonic run there. The clock is going now. We've been five minutes, 26 seconds since the car entered the measured mile. We've got to be back within the hour. Richard Noble didn't need to worry. It was a textbook turnaround. Leaving the end of the measured mile, I knew that we'd been comfortably supersonic. We've been faster than ever. That was the fastest run ever. Um, very aware of the fact we had just made history, we'd just achieved everything we set out to. But I couldn't even for a second sit back and say, yeah, great, because I'm doing 770 miles an hour. And I've got to slow this car down uh, safely to a halt. And average for the mile, 763.035. And a provisional Mach number on the return run 1.020. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've just achieved what we set out to achieve all those years ago. Eh? It's, um, it's really something. It's the most awe-inspiring, humbling experience you can imagine. Everybody went berserk. The ambulance planes were flying around doing wingovers. <laughs> you know, everybody was just so excited. It was just a fantastic moment. You know, this was this was a bit of world history, a tiny little bit of world history, and everybody was celebrating. It was just brilliant. For Andy Green, it was the achievement of a lifetime. We've already done the greatest record, the one that everybody said couldn't be done. We have pioneered that trail. Even if we followed, we would only be tourists in our own footsteps second time round. Breaking the sound barrier on land is an extraordinary record. Until the next generation of jet engine becomes available, the thrust team has pushed technology to the edge. But even the mighty jet may one day be replaced. Technologies of the future are opening up new frontiers for land speed racing.
Back in 1898, the very first vehicle to hold the land speed record was an electric car. Over 100 years later, technology has come full circle. Pat Rummerfield is the man at the controls of a car actively pushing the frontiers of technology, and it's no toy. This is White Lightning, a high-performance land speed vehicle for a modern age. Its crew is out on Bonneville, pushing the boundaries, just like the pioneers of the jet cars in the 1960s. This machine runs on what is to become the propulsion system of the 21st century. A few years ago, it would have seemed as unlikely as a car breaking the sound barrier. But White Lightning is an electric car, capable of speeds even greater than Formula One racing cars. Uh, we got over 6,000 batteries here. I don't think anyone's ever wired so many small batteries together at the same time. We could get uh, uh, 300 kilowatts of power. 300 kilowatts is 30,000 hundred watt light bulbs all at the same time. Attempting the electric land speed record once seemed impossible for Pat Rummerfield. But for him, battling the odds is nothing new. Doctors are amazed that he's alive at all. Rummerfield's playful nature belies an incredible story of personal courage and determination. <laughs> St. Louis, Missouri. Rummerfield has become something of a test subject. 25 years ago, a horrific car crash left him fighting for his life. My best friend was driving my Corvette, and uh, we went up uh, onto the freeway doing about 135 miles an hour. He lost control of the car, and we went flying uh, off the freeway. His friend walked away without a scratch, but doctors are stunned that Rummerfield is able to walk at all. On the initial impact, I had a wine bottle stuck between my legs. And as I was hanging on, the initial impact slammed my head down between my legs, uh, hitting the wine bottle, popping this eye out of the socket. It just popped it out. From there, I went into the windshield and came back at such velocity that it sheared the seat. When paramedics found him, he had sustained multiple injuries to his shoulder, chest, and neck. The outlook was grim. After arriving at the trauma center, a team of orthopedic and neurosurgeons met with my father and told him basically I had 72 hours to live, that I was just too busted up for them to do anything with. Rummerfield had damaged his spinal cord and was paralyzed from the neck down. But he refused to give in, defying the odds his 72-hour life expectancy stretched first to three weeks, then three months. I asked them to put a, uh, my, the x-ray of my neck and my cervical up over my bed. And I'd lay there and I'd look at that x-ray and I'd, I'd say, Every, everything's going to be OK, don't panic. I'd lay in there daydreaming about racing cars and playing basketball when all of a sudden my left big toe moved. And it was just like that. There was unbelievable pain. It felt like I was being electrocuted. Immediately after that came the, the hot pokers. It felt like I was being burnt everywhere. It was just like my body was on fire. With an internal flick of a switch, Rummerfield's brain had found a way to reroute electrical impulses throughout his entire nervous system. We don't know exactly what it is about Pat that allowed him to recover to such a great extent. If you compare his MRI, to other individuals that appear to have the same degree of injury in the spinal cord, yet they're stuck in a wheelchair. 
took him almost two years to walk, you know, well over, you know, seven years to even partially run. If he doesn't exercise every single day, that greatly reduces his ability to even walk. So you can imagine how hard Pat needs to work to break the land speed record. Pat Rummerfield wages a constant battle against paralysis. To him, attempting a land speed record will prove a point. I run in marathons. I haven't won one. I mean, I usually come in last. But when it comes to setting land speed records, where you put a, a person with a disability on an even keel with able-bodied people, I wear these so I can't hear myself scream. I think my past successes have proven that we are just as capable as any able-bodied person if given the chance. As Rummerfield climbs into his cramped cockpit, the atmosphere is tense. He knows that without three years of hard work by his team, he wouldn't be here. Spending time away from his strict exercise regime is taking its toll. Because of his spinal injuries, Rummerfield's body feels the effects of fatigue more than most. For him, an attempt at the record cannot start soon enough. I won't have any problem with it, I don't think. But it's rough down by the five on the left side. It's a little bumpy, it's starting to get bumpy. With uh, my background, the first couple times that I drove the White Lightning back in the, uh, the early years, I'm, I'm pretty sure the first couple runs, I probably held my breath the whole way. At last, officials give Rummerfield clearance to attempt the first leg of the two-way run required for an electric world record. White Lightning is unlike any other land speed car. Its engine produces no characteristic roar, just the whine of a single battery-powered motor. From the outside, the car is almost stealth-like. It's so silent, it, it just looks like, almost like a mirage as it's floating down and it's just hovering right, right above the salt. But inside the car, it's a different story. The salt, as you're going over 200 miles an hour, sounds just like someone's underneath the car with a sandblaster. Any uh, shock or any bumps is uh, translated right up to my spine, to my brain. Not an ideal situation for a person with spinal injuries. Your brain has to work three to four times harder to translate the uh, images coming through. You're so fiercely concentrating on peering out that window, searching for the mile markers, and you don't take your foot off the accelerator unless you absolutely have to. It's a very fast run, but the car is so quiet that the support team has trouble picking it out as it glides across the salt. That's what I'm telling you. I can see the yellow chute, and I can see the, the car. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. You guys got a yellow shoe, right? Yellow and black shoe. As Rummerfield pulls in, the crew gets word of his speed through the first run. You got the number? No. 248. Wow. Good shape. Good. The existing record stands at 215 miles per hour. With a speed of 248, Rummerfield is on course for a new record. <laughs> the challenge now is to get the car repowered in time for a return run. If the car doesn't make the second run back through the mile within one hour, they'll miss the record.
Exhausted, Pat Rummerfield remains inside White Lightning as the crew replaces 20 racks of batteries and runs systems checks. Forty-five minutes later, comfortably ahead of schedule, both car and driver are primed for their return run. We gotta send the electric car. As the car heads back down the course, Rummerfield is just moments away from the history books. Rummerfield knows he's fast, but the official time will be the one handed down by the FIA timing station. As he opens his canopy, word from the timing officials comes through. They've done it. 245.524, average over the mile. Congratulations, you did it, guys. I feel like God truly blessed me. I've, I've gotten a second chance, and this run was right on the edge. Yesterday's history, tomorrow's mystery, and today's blessing. <laughs> Pat Rummerfield epitomizes the spirit of those who pursue the land speed record. He has proved that electric cars are the future. One day, they may even eclipse the jet cars. The land speed record is the ultimate race, a race that has lasted for over a hundred years. One day, Andy Green's supersonic record will be broken. Whoever tries it is going to find it very, very difficult to go faster than we did. What I hope is that they succeed, and they succeed sometime soon. For someone who cheated death in the pursuit of the world record, Art Arfons knows how much courage that will take. I think he's going to sit there for a while. A long while. <laughs> The only limit Craig Breedlove foresees is that of the human spirit. As long as someone is willing to build the car and go forward, and they can find the funding to do it, the land speed record is something that'll just perpetuate. There's only one thing that, that can guarantee our failure, that's if we quit. For those in the pursuit of land speed, human nature will never let that happen.